Thanks. We've been talking a lot about objects today, artifacts and airframes. I'm going to take this in a totally different direction. In aviation archaeology, we tend to think of that which is tangible, the crash site itself, the impact crater, debris field, etc. Relics collected as souvenirs or for museum exhibits, memorials and historical markers, and most ambitious of all, aircraft recovery and restoration. But each aircraft accident represents a collection of potential lessons that might be learned, thereby possibly preventing future loss of life and property. One of those lessons is that the root cause is, essential, is usually not just one thing. Professor James Reason has developed a model of safety vulnerabilities in highly technical and complex organizations or systems in which areas of vulnerability are holes in the layers of defense guarding against error. He calls this the Swiss cheese model. The holes are constantly changing size, shape, and location as an organization or project evolves over time, changing management decisions, procedures, regulations, and technology introduce new variables. Accidents occur when the holes line up. It seems like a disproportionately large number of aviation accidents result from human factors issues. People tend to oversimplify by using the term human error, but this barely scratches the surface. Human factors can be broken down into a number of categories and subcategories. Here are a few examples. To illustrate how aircraft accidents might provide valuable lessons, I'm going to present three case studies in which organizational factors were predominantly responsible for the resulting mishaps. Many people are involved in flight operations, both on the ground and in the cockpit. The coordinated efforts of all of these personnel are required for success. A weak link in the chain can lead to disaster. In June 1966, a representative of General Electric Corporation requested a formation flight for the purpose of shooting publicity photos of a group of airplanes all powered by GE engines. They included the XB-70, an F-4, F-5, T-38, and F-104. The photo mission was included on a non-interference basis at the end of a regularly scheduled XB-70 test flight. Motion picture and still photographers were carried aboard a civilian Learjet flying chase. A pre-flight briefing failed to include specific separation distances for each aircraft or to formally designate a formation commander. The XB-70 command pilot and the F-4 pilot were not even present at the briefing but were later briefed by phone. The closest airplane to the XB-70 was a NASA F-104, just off the bomber's right wing. Three quarters of an hour into the photo session, the F-104 was caught in the bomber's wake vortex, possibly as a result of a slight inadvertent stick input. The F-104 drifted into contact with the XB-70's wingtip and rolled across the top of the bomber through its twin tails. The F-104 instantly disintegrated, killing NASA research pilot Joe Walker, while the XB-70 continued to fly straight and level for several seconds before rolling into a spin. XB-70 pilot Al White ejected using an escape capsule, but his co-pilot Carl Cross failed to do so. What was the cost? Two experienced test pilots dead and one injured. More than a million dollars for the F-104 and more than 200 million for the XB-70. This accident resulted from a number of procedural errors. The XB-70 test force director approved the photo session despite initial objections from the airplane's manufacturer, North American Aviation. The test force director did not seek approval from higher headquarters. The XB-70 program director did not voice any objection to plans for the formation flight. Weather conditions led to a change in altitude, route, and direction of flight from those briefed prior to the mission. The photo plan was not equipped with UHF radio, so communications had to be relayed through a ground station, adding further delays. 
The planned 30-minute formation time was extended to 45 minutes, increasing pilot workload. The F-104 pilot did not have good visual references to judge distance from the XB-70, and he may have been distracted due to other nearby air traffic, specifically a B-58 in the supersonic corridor overhead. Post-accident analysis revealed a classic example of Reason's Swiss cheese model. Afterward, the Air Force made numerous administrative changes to improve operational procedures, starting with correction of supervisory and procedural weaknesses within the responsible test organization. In the summer of 1984, a B-1A prototype was used for systems development tests in support of the B-1B program. Objectives for this test flight included minimum control speed tests to evaluate the bomber's handling characteristics in various configurations. Throughout the flight, warning lights on the master caution panel occasionally illuminated. Because the situations most often were not serious, the pilot simply reset the master caution each time. The crew gradually became anesthetized to the alarms, ignoring vital information. This condition is known as warning fatigue. The dynamic minimum control speed test was conducted at 300 knots calibrated airspeed, below 10,000 feet mean sea level, with wings swept forward, flaps extended, and gear down. The actual altitude above the ground was just 4,000 feet. The pilot swept the wings in one continuous motion, despite being advised to do so in stages to manage changes in the center of gravity. At the time, control room personnel had turned away from their strip charts to discuss the quality of the data received during previous test points. Nobody was monitoring the data when the airplane stalled and spun. Casualties included one experienced test pilot killed, two injured. Material loss, uh, more than $325 million. Prior to this mission, there had been a change in personnel in the B-1 test program. A relatively inexperienced mission planner replaced a highly experienced one. Test points at full aft sweep and clean condition and full forward sweep dirty configurations were scheduled without an intermediate test point in between. There was an uneven mix of experience in the cockpit. The pilot in command had less than 14 hours in the B-1. The co-pilot, Doug Benefield, who died in the, when the crew escape capsule struck the ground, was described as probably the most experienced and knowledge, knowledgeable B-1 pilot in the world. Deference on the part of the pilot in command to the co-pilot resulted in what is known as silent incapacitation. The crew failed to manually transfer fuel during the wing sweep, resulting in a severe out-of-trim condition. And because the crew was anesthetized to alarms on the master caution panel, they ignored an important warning. There were no indicators to highlight unsafe aircraft parameters, and there was no coordination between control room personnel and the air crew regarding the aircraft's center of gravity. Additionally, control room personnel were not monitoring the flight during a critical phase of the mission. The most significant lesson was that a clear need there was a clear need for cockpit discipline, adherence to protocol, and attention to detail. In January 1995, uh, this X-31 had completed its final test mission, and the pilot was going through pre-landing checklist when he noticed an airspeed anomaly. He correctly guessed that the problem was most likely the result of ice in the pitot tube. The pilot stated his intention to leave the pitot heat switch on rather than turn it off as called for on the checklist. The X-31 was equipped with a Kyle probe, which is highly susceptible to icing due to the Venturi effect. The Kyle probe is not equipped with a heating system, but mission rules stated that the X-31 would never be flown in icing conditions. Moments after the flight controller informed the pilot that pitot heat was not hooked up, the airplane departed controlled flight, forcing the pilot to eject. One experienced test pilot was injured. Material loss was approximately $80 million. The sad part is 
that at any time prior to loss of control, the pilot could have activated the reversionary flight control mode, thus saving the airplane. A number of issues were identified as contributory causes. Automation bias, catastrophic consequences of pitot-static system failure were discovered in simulations but failed to lead to any corrective action, reliance on flight control system warning enunciators, lack of configuration awareness, the change from a heated rose mount probe to the unheated Kyle probe. The Kyle probe's susceptibility to icing was not known to all project personnel and the pitot heat switch was not placarded as being inoperative. There was also poor communications. The, there were system safety analyses that failed to identify potential catastrophic consequences of failure in the pitot static system. The configuration control process failed to disseminate the condition of the pitot heating system to people who needed to know. The majority of the test team was unaware of the inoperative condition of the switch. Uh, crew resource management, there was complacency in the control room, uh, the pilot's lack of situation awareness, and lack of in information sharing, simple communications. Uh, the most important lessons were the need for improved configuration awareness, communications, and cockpit resource management. Obviously, due to time constraints, I have presented very abbreviated versions of these case studies. So why is any of this important? Uh, aircraft mishap case studies provide important lessons for understanding the interaction between people and aircraft systems, as well as with each other during flight operations. Organizations involved with aircraft should consider archiving and reviewing case studies of disasters and near misses in order, in order to avoid repeating errors in the future. In the second part of my presentation, I would like to discuss remotely piloted and autonomous aircraft. Due to the expanding numbers of these types of aircraft, there has been a commensurate rise in the number of accidents. Remotely piloted aircraft are being increasingly used for both civil and military applications. Some studies suggest that RPA accident rates exceed those associated with crewed aircraft by several orders of magnitude. By far, the greater percentage of RPA mishaps is attributed to human factors. We frequently hear terms like drone and unmanned aircraft. Use of the term unmanned to describe any sort of autonomous or remotely piloted aircraft is often misunderstood to mean that there is little or no human systems integration involved. In fact, RPA operations involve numerous people in every aspect of control, operation, and maintenance, regardless of the vehicle's level of autonomy. In most respects, RPA operations are identical to those involving conventionally crewed aircraft but the ge geographic separation of aircraft and crew necessitates particular attention to human factors engineering when developing such systems. In the first part of this presentation, we looked at individual case studies. This time, we will look at broad concepts based on lessons learned from a large number of aircraft accidents and incidents. Again, the focus is on human factors. Since RPA systems vary widely in size and complexity, the specific percentage of human factors involvement varies according to aircraft model. Common causes of RPA mishaps include cognitive factors, physiological factors, environmental factors, staffing factors, and design factors. Any of these alone or in combination can degrade human performance and increase the likelihood of a mishap. Cognitive factors are primarily related to pilot workload. Long duration missions can present extended periods of low workload during cruise, interspersed with brief periods of high workload at takeoff, landing, or during mission operations. Malfunctions or unexpected conditions can result in intensely high mental workload. Even with the ability to swap out operations at virtually any time, uh, operators at virtually any time. RPA crews are still subject to fatigue and stress. Weariness resulting from insufficient sleep, extended periods of mental or physical work, or prolonged periods of anxiety can affect RPA operators during long duration missions. 
Operator fatigue may result in reduced reaction time and decreased vigilance that can degrade performance, productivity, safety, and mission effectiveness. A survey of 66 Predator pilots found that nearly half suffered from fatigue that impaired job performance, and 40% reported a moderate to high likelihood of falling asleep at their stations while operating a weapon carrying remotely piloted aircraft. Degraded situational awareness results from failure to correctly perceive information, failure to integrate or comprehend information, or failure to project future actions or system states. RPA pilots lack such physical cues as visibility, motion, sound, feel, and even smell. Relevant factors include reduced cockpit visibility, data link bandwidth limitations, color discrimination, uplink, downlink signal lag, and channelized attention. Good training, effective communications, and teamwork are critical to the safe operation of remotely piloted vehicles. Elements of an effective training program include the use of experienced instructors, well-defined standards, and effective evaluation processes. Instructors should be sure to emphasize the value of effective crew coordination. Inadequate training, failure to follow established procedures, and lack of crew coordination are common factors in RPA mishaps. Many so-called human errors result directly from design shortfalls in the human-machine interface. Cockpit displays need to present data in such a manner as to allow for efficient interpretation by the operator. Control characteristics should be sufficiently forgiving to prevent catastrophic failure in the event that the pilot is slow to make a critical control input. So here are some of the major lessons for breaking the RPA mishap chain. Learning from past experience is fundamental to the development of safe and efficient new systems and to improving existing systems. Future mishaps might be avoided through the collection, archiving, and study of data on past accidents and incidents to learn valuable lessons. Although there are no humans on board remotely piloted aircraft, there are numerous humans involved in all aspects of RPA operations. Human factors affect RPA safety at every level of design, management, maintenance, and flight operations. Because human factors are consistently cited as a major cause of RPA mishaps, an understanding of the associated causal factors is essential for improving the reliability of remotely piloted aircraft. I've been researching aircraft accidents for more than two decades. At first, I was primarily looking for crash sites of airplanes that were of particular personal interest. Later, I worked with various museums to recover artifacts for exhibit. In the past five years, I have been compiling information on the causes of various accidents and incidents and distilling the lessons learned into collections of case studies, technical papers, and presentations. The results have been made available through NASA and the Aerospace Medical Association. These are a few examples of some of the books I've written on this subject. Hard copies of these books are available from the U.S. Government Printing Office, or you can download electronic copies for free from the NASA eBook server. Your tax dollars at work. Any questions? Yes, sir. Uh, the aircraft on the cover of Crash Course is the Helios prototype. It was a solar-powered unmanned aerial vehicle uh, used for research. It was supposed to fly uh, up to about 100,000 feet. I think the highest they got it was around 97,000 feet. Um, unfortunately, in this particular instance with that picture, um, they got into a, a pilot-induced oscillation, which is not something you normally think of when there's no pilot on board, but the operator uh, on the ground uh, made a control input and there was some lag and he made another input and by the time he did that, the first input was already uh, happening. So he got into a PIO situation and it overstressed the airframe, which then started coming apart. You know, that was a very lightweight aircraft. Uh, the top of it was covered with solar cells and the, uh, the, the rest of the structure was lightweight plastic and styrofoam and it was wrapped in a clear uh, mylar covering. So it's a, a very lightweight kind of vehicle. So you can see how it kind of came apart there. Any other questions? Okay, thank you very much.